Hey, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, right. Doug. Clemens, you there? Yes. <laughs> so excited. Mr. Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning. Christian? Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, Dustin. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, Heinz? I'm here. Hello. Uh, David? Hello. Hello. Eric? Hello. Sorry. Hello. Yep. Ginger? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Javier? Yes. Here. All right. Lance? Yep, I'm here. All right, Manuel. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Excellent. And Nick? Hi. Hello. Scott? Doug, Doug, Doug. Hey, Scott. Thomas? I'm here. Oh, I'm going to completely butcher your last name. I think I'm getting it. Maybe. There we go. Okay. Uh, Ryan? Hello. Hello. Tommy? Hey. Hello. And uh, let's see, yeah, there was one other. Timur? Timur? Yeah. There you go, I gotcha. Hello. Uh, who is that? Who is that? Sounds too happy. Oh, there he so, is. Okay. Slinky. Slinky, okay. <laughs> Francisco. Uh, uh, let's see, Sergey, are you there? Mm hmm. All right. Uh, Klaus. Yes, I'm there. Wow, we got a really full house today. This is cool. All right, I know I'm missing somebody here. Do, 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 do. Hey, dog, this is Vlad. Hey, Vlad. I, and my window big enough, I saw you at the bottom there. All right, did I get everybody so far? Hey, dog. Hi, dog. This is Vinay here. Oh, okay. Vinay, okay. I thought someone else was trying to speak in there. Oh, yeah, that was me, Christoph. Christoph. All right. Jim, you there? Yes, I am. Hey. Wow. All right. How's everybody doing? Thanks. How are you? Good. Good. Ian, um, I don't know your. I can't remember your last name, Ian. If this is not your first time in, I apologize. Are you there, Ian? Looks like you're trying so hard. Do me a favor, Ian. If you can get to the meeting minutes, I'll paste the link into the chat. If you can just add your last name and your company if you want to be associated with a company. I apologize if you've been here before, I just can't remember. It's how much you actually don't need to do that each time. I appreciate the thought, though. <laughs> Whoops. All right, three after. Why don't I go ahead and get started? Uh, let's see, how many people do we have? 27. All right. Um, community time. Okay. Anything from the community that people would like to bring up that is not on the agenda? All right, not hearing any. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, no, we have no updates from the SIG um, discussions. I really need to go back and poke uh, Liz, the chair of the TOC, to find out what she wants to do next in terms of the next steps. So I'll let you guys know if anything changes. Um, we do have a SDK call today, right after this one. Uh, we do. I know we have at least one topic on the agenda, so please join that. All right, yeah. uh, two more. Oh, yeah. Just want to Sorry, say something. Quick, quick. Yeah, quick question. This is Vinay here. So you mentioned um, the uh, conversation with the TOC chair, and uh, I mean, what? Sorry, can you just remind us about the context on that was? Yeah. So that's about what do we do with our working group? Do we turn our working group right. into a SIG, or do we come a working group under SIG app delivery? And the right. current thought is to make us a, a working group under SIG app delivery. Okay, Ryan, your hands up. Yeah, sorry, I don't know if we did community time yet. I was distracted for a minute there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, just, I mentioned in chat, I think last week, um, that uh, there's interest, at least within my company, of, of defining uh, a binding for Amazon Kinesis uh, for cloud events. Um, and I know you pinged 
Tim, Doug. Uh, I, don't, I haven't heard from him at all. I don't know if there's anybody from Amazon on the call, but um, I actually, I took a stab at it. Um, I just don't know where to put it uh, since the, uh, um, the proprietary findings uh, live in separate repositories typically owned by the organization that owns the protocol. So I'm happy to throw it in a gist or open up an issue, um, but just looking for some guidance there. So just out of curiosity, is that more like the adapters that we have, or is that more like a actual transport mapping? It's a transport mapping. It's okay. pretty straightforward, um, but uh, I, I felt like it might be useful to formally specify it. They use they use uh, they use HTTP, don't they? They do. They have some weird things like um, the actual um, structure of the JSON object encloses the data, um, and everything needs to be Base sixty four encoded. Um, so just formally specifying that, and also they do have. Uh, I know in the Kafka binding uh, spec. Um, we, we have a section that specifies um, that the, um, if you're using the, um, uh, shoot, I'm forgetting the extension name, but the essentially the partition key ex extension uh, that could have one of the other properties in, uh, in Kinesis as well. So um, I don't know if I uh, just figured it might be useful to, to spec and, and get people's thoughts. So tell you what, let me take the action item to send a note to Tim from AWS and put you on it. And that way, <clears throat> try, to, try to help force the conversation. Would that be helpful? Sure. OK. Thanks for doing that, by the way. No problem. OK, anything else for community time? All right, thank you, folks. Uh, OK. Uh, workflow update. Timur? Yeah, uh, we're still waiting for the SIG app delivery to make the decision on our, since our presentation. Uh, we also have work with uh, comparing the specification with um, Argo workflow and also currently working on the Tecton pipeline one comparison from their example so far that's going pretty well. Um, I do have a quick question, which can be taken offline to, to not take up too much of the meeting time, but regarding uh, the GitHub repository, we wanted to add some uh, API and SPI, so there'll be like Java code, but currently we're in the, the, the workflow subdirectory and, and I can't really set up like CLI and GitHub hooks and stuff like that, kind of like what we wanted to do with the code, what I think similar Cloud Events is doing for the SDK stuff. Um, and I just would like to get some maybe ideas and help possibly getting a separate GitHub repository where we have all the, all the um, uh, rights to do that stuff or what would you guys suggest? But again, this can be taken offline. Yeah, let's take it offline because remember in the past when we tried to get you guys your own repo, I, I got some resistance and they said, no, make them a real work group first or a separate project first. And that's why you ended up down this path of becoming a sandbox project. Um, yeah, so, okay, so we'll wait for the decision then, but- I'll Yeah, be, unfortunately, I, I think we kind of have to. Okay. Okay, any questions about the workflow stuff? Okay, in that case, Clemens, would you like to do a very short reminder, everybody about your proposal with a, with a pointer to it? Yes. Um, so the idea is to create a very simple HTTP based um, um, or pr primarily HTTP based schema registry, which is really a, um, a repository for any kind of um, serialization or validation schema. So whether you want to store JSON schema or Avro schema or XML schema, whatever you want, you don't want to store. Um, with a very simple mechanism the, there is a notion of effectively three levels. There's a notion of schema groups. Schema groups allow, are there to allow grouping of schemas and specifically for ACLing groups of schemas because that's usually a concern for um, applications that inside of a schema group uh, live schemas um, and each schema may have multiple versions. And the mechanism here is that you can go and create a new schema and the, the seed version, if you will, by just doing a put against the schema's collection with the schema name. And that will go and create the first version. 
And then you can also do the same, basically the same again, if there are existing versions and that creates a new version. And then the, ski, the mechanism on the, on the back of it, the implementation may then, uh, or you can also go and target directly the schemas collection uh, with a post. Um, and uh, then you, um, the schema collection then ha can have smarts optionally. And that's something that's up to the application on how it wants to do this. If it has particular a particular idea about how to, um, you know, of policy for the schemas, like for instance, if you want to enforce that if you are storing for a particular schema group, um, if you want to have a policy that um, makes sure that all the Avro schemas must be backwards compatible, um, they can go and apply that policy. And which means if you're, if you're now creating, if you're adding a new schema to the version collection um, for that particular schema, that if that is not backwards compatible, that, that gets rejected. So that's a mechanism that's, that I've also um, effectively described here as the 409 conflict. So that's a super, super, super simple mechanism, I think, um, that is um, a starting point for a discussion. Uh, we don't, we're not, we're not wedded to this particular proposal, but uh, we believe that a schema registry that works for cloud events overall um, is useful and necessary. Um, because um, we have a data schema field and we are now, um, we were talking about you know, schematized, um, all kinds of schematized uh, serialization formats and um, having something that is um, supported in the um, community broadly um, is I think generally useful, not only for us for the cloud events case, but also more broadly for the messaging community and for the eventing community, and that's something where we can, um, as the cloud events project or um, as the serverless working group, do good work. So I think this is so. This is an initial proposal, but really it's an invitation for an interested group of people to come together and hash out what the right structure for that thing would be, um, and then come to effectively REST API that we can um, then jointly implement and write some code for. All right, any questions for Clemens or comments? Okay. Um, in that case, I think from a process perspective, um, since this was just opened yesterday, I think it makes sense to at least let it sit there out there f until next week's call. And I think the next step in the process might be just to take it a vote or unanimous consent if no one objects to saying yes or no to having this be a formal work stream under, I assume you want this under cloud events, not serverless, right, Clemens? Um, I don't, I haven't decided, I haven't settled on what the right place is for that yet. So we have, we certainly are interested in making that, making that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with, you know, seeking, seeking for a venue here and uh, we're coming here um, as the first candidate venue believe because we believe that that's uh, the right place um, for for to do this whether we do this under cloud events or whether we do this in the serverless working group or something that I'm not particular about um, okay but um, um, so we believe that this is urgently needed as a convention because um, there are now several vendor specific um, and um, uh, interfaces um, and there are non-free implementations that people are using that seem to be very popular. And I would like to um, get us to a point where we can have a free implementation that everybody can go and use. And um, for that, we need to have an interface that everybody can go and support. And since there is none um, of, that, of that simplicity um, or of the required simplicity that everybody can go and agree on, um, we're just proposing one here. So um, that's the that's the point of it. And um, to there's a question in the chat whether I showed that to the JSON schema open API and async API communities. The the answer is no, I did not um, because this this here is the community um, that I just showed that to first. Okay. Um... Okay, because I do feel like there are a couple of other process questions uh, that we need to resolve. Now, for example, which Git rep repo would the proposed spec go into? Um, mm -hmm. But I guess we could we could 
we can answer that question when we get past the high order question, which is, should this broader group work on it at all, period? Yes. And I think we should probably look to maybe have a, a vote next week, unless a whole bunch of flurry of activity comes up and it get into a big discussion. But if there is no major discussion, then uh, we should push for some sort of resolution next week. Okay. And I will send out a note um, drawing this, drawing people's attention to this. Yeah. Does that sound fair? Yeah, and if that if that ends up being if that ends up being a no vote, then we're going to take that elsewhere. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Okay, any other questions, comments for Clemens? All right, cool. Thank you, Clemens. Okay, um, okay, PR reviews. So, hopefully, an easy one here. Actually, I guess I should ask before we jump into PR and issues. Is there anything else people? Think I'm skipping it that we need to talk about? Okay, cool. Um, so I'd mentioned this last week, but it was too soon to uh, to approve it. Basically, this is just um, uh, adding the new specs to the checkers that we have, and I fixed a couple of bad hrefs and tried to modify the RC two one one nineteen wording to make sure all the uses are actually aligned with that. I believe Mike found one case where I think the href was may have been wrong. I fixed that for him. Um, anybody have any questions about this? Need more time to review? Obviously, this isn't the final version of the spec, so PRs are always welcome later as well. But I just want to be able to make sure that the, the checkers work. OK, any objection to approving then? All right, thank you. All right. Slinky, would you like to talk about this one? Uh, yeah, so I've rewarded uh, the distributed tracing extension as you explained me uh, last week or the previous week, I don't remember, uh, during this call. So yeah, take a look. Tell me what do you think about it? Okay. Um, there was one question from Ian. Hold on. I think the question from Ian is more um, the, do, does this change? I mean, the, because this change somehow uh, restricts the behavior of this extension. Am I right? Is Ian here? I think Ian is so, on the call. Yeah. Um, so at least the way I, I read the change is uh, it kind of, it. It's not just the rewording, but it kind of semantically changes the meaning of the extension and makes it less useful as um, a mechanism for trace propagation. So uh, that's the reason for my comment. Um, and I'm also not quite sure what the, the motivation behind the change is, um, but maybe I'm not um, understanding the change. So I don't know if you could clarify a little bit, um, kind of the, the difference uh, and the use case for the changed uh, extension. So Francesco, could you elaborate on why you thought it needed a change? Uh, the, needed? the reality is that I, I merely wrote what <laughs> you guys told me like uh, last week, so. Uh, no, I, I, think, think, I, th I think this is a discussion. Uh, I mean, it's something that the original authors of the distributed tracing extension should apply to. Because I, I really merely rewarded what you told me uh, last. No, I, I think what Ian was asking for was why did this even pop up on your radar in the first place? And what was wrong with, with the original I, spec? Because personally, I didn't, I, I didn't felt uh, it was clear to me what this distributed tracing extension is about. Uh, really, I, 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 I it, um, uh, Ian is working with me on implementing this uh, distributed tracing extension for a specific uh, use case in a, in another community project, and I found like it was not really clear if what the way we were using this extension was intended to use that way. Like for example, middleware sh the middleware should ch uh, should modify the trace context. The middleware should modify or the middleware should that the trace parent, or it's something that should be done by the source. I mean, the, those, uh, these kind of questions 
popped up while we were implementing the spec. And that's the reason why, I, uh, in first instance, I said the A equal to me, this doesn't look really clear. Great. So Ian, your, your question here, especially talking about using it for non HTTP protocols, I think is, is a good one. Because I think implicit in your question is that uh, the tracing value may change from hop to hop. When, I'm sorry, the CE value will change or might change as it goes from hop to hop, the same way the HTTP header would, right? And I don't think yeah, that's yeah. the intent. So the, the way I read the, uh, the current version of the, the spec is that it's meant to be like a, a trace propagation uh, mechanism, um, essentially the same as the HTTP trace context headers are, um, but for uh, non protocols and format. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I guess, are you saying that, that that's not what you um, believe the purpose of the extension to? Yeah, so Jim, I'll, I'll get to you in a sec, but let me, let me try to answer. My understanding was that this value is meant to represent the original value from the original sender. And that the real trace header actually may change as it goes through all the various hops. The CE value is not necessarily going to stay in sync with the real header value, which is why I rephrase it as the original header, the original value, not necessarily the true complete value at the destination. So that's why when you start talking about, oh, it's supposed to be used for non HTTP protocols. Well, I don't think it is because that implies that when you are in HTTP, that they're always in sync as they go from hop to hop. And I don't think that's true. At least that's my understanding of it. But I gotta be honest, this one's always confused me. So Jem, you wanna jump in? I was gonna say the same thing actually. Um, the, my understanding is it exactly lines up with Doug's in that this is meant to be the trace from the sender to the receiver in their context. It's not meant to mutate as, as it travels um, through intermediaries because you know, it's not there to do the distributed tracing of all of the uh, processes that the intermediaries use, yeah? Um, so it, it, for instance, if I have um, a sensor that emits an event and maybe I pass it through um, Clemens's event grid before it ends up in one of my processes, I, I wouldn't expect to understand all the component tracing within event grid. Yeah. Um, I'm only interested in the trace between the source and the, uh, and my business processes. That, that was my understanding. Okay. So I guess my comment is more, what, what, what is the use case for having two separate direct traces, one that includes some middleware and one that doesn't? You know, for example, if you um, if you do update the tracing extension, uh, you know it's always possible to recover the tr the spans that you're interested in by filtering out those intermediate spans at some later stage, right? So, um, so yeah, I'm not, and it seems like uh, tracing systems in general are just not well suited for dealing with more than one trace context at a given time. Um, and in fact, I don't know a system that does that. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I'm just not sure um, what, uh, what the motivation um, for that or, or the use case would be. I, I think the only, conf maybe where it got confusing um, and guys back me up on this, is originally when that extension was written, there was no reference to the HCB transport spec. Um, but when, uh, but as that was being finalized, I think somebody connected the dots to the W3C thing, um, or wherever that other spec is coming from, um, and sort of proposed it as a, you know, as a mapping for you know, that particular transport because there was somewhere to put it. 
because there was quite there were similar questions coming up about well you know this other thing exists is specified so should i put it in there and i i, I think that was where some of this confusion came from okay so clemen said it uh, let me my hand was up first let me just um quick question and i don't I know almost nothing about the distributed tracing spec. So I'm asking this just because this question keeps coming up many times. Does it make sense to even have this extension at all? I guess is my question, right? What would be lost if we just dropped it? Because I'm wondering whether it's causing more confusion than actually helping. Because when it's there, people are gonna say, hey, it's there, I should implement it. But if we can't explain the use case that is actually useful, because I've heard people say, you don't need this because the, the real tracing header has the original value in there embedded someplace. I, th I think I heard that. So why do we need a separate field just for the original? <laughs> so I, the, the, let me just put that question out there. Do we actually need this at all? And, and I think Clemens, your hand was up next after mine. So, so in, in, in basic support and gem in that, in that discussion, um, this exists. Uh, so those, those two fields exist because they are exclusive to the cloud event, which we are with, with what we're doing here, effectively tunneling through um, different transports. So the, the, the relationship to the HTTP trace is only that the HTTP trace gets seeded in the context established for the cloud event. So the cloud event is being generated somewhere. And from that application, you effectively create a trace context. That trace count context is now effectively inherited by the HTTP uh, pipeline, if we want to call it that way, where you're starting an HTTP request, you're running the HTTP request through a proxy that goes through a, ver a reverse proxy that goes to an application server, and those are already three um, uh, elements of HTTP processing that probably for debugging should be traced. But that's only relevant to the HTTP processing. That should be able to, to link up to the original cause of this, um, which is you know, the original request. That has, however, no, no relationship, that HTTP processing, really no relationship to the end-to-end -end handling of that event. So you have effectively two different graphs that are both rooted in the same cause, and that is the original trace context. So there's an end-to-end -end relationship which is expressed in the cloud event, which is, an which is an immutable value once created because that, that value basically ends up in the consumer and then the consumer can again, root its own further tracing in that, uh, which is originate, which is effectively um, uh, based on the original context that the application that has emitted that event has created. Um, but that is independent of the tracing that happens for um, at the um, respective transport path. So the only so the reason why we need this um, extension is that we want to be able to manifest the original trace context for propagation um, in the in the event, independent of what happens at the transport layer. Uh, Slinky, oh. next. Oh, Francisco, you, did you join? Did you really want to drop from the queue? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, first I want to echo what you said that uh, if you want to keep the spec as is now, so that, rep uh, that the trace power represents the original uh, trace, uh, th does it really make sense to have the spec? Because Tracing systems, in theory, are designed to, uh, from the from the child span from the child span ID that I can go back up to the original span. So that's that's the first point. And the second point is that I'm seeing also in the chat uh, is that uh, you're saying that we should have uh, we should use this part of the, this distributed tracing uh, really to transport trace informations in non HTTP uh, protocols. And my worry is that maybe this is not the right place where this should happen. Also because we have this, and if, from a mere stand, uh, if, from an implementation point of view, uh, we still have the uh, structured encoding that needs to be 
decoded, uh, needs to be written to uh, read it transparent and so on. So I'm, I'm not sure the really cloud events is the right place to do that. Also because uh, some uh, open telemetry, for example, already has some integration with Kafka uh, where they send things uh, using uh, Kafka headers, using the transparent, which is similar to HP. Okay, Scott, your hands up next. Hey, so uh, one thing that's weird about this particular extension is if this event goes into things like Kafka, we could potentially have these uh, like replay events out of that queue and now we have traces that kind of branch out uh, very largely. So it, it feels like what we're trying to do is trace an event from source to wherever it's going to land, but the replay event feels like a different event that's, that needs to be traced in a different way, right? So I'm wondering what yeah. people think about that problem. You mean the delivery of that needs to be traced separately? I, I think so, yeah. It's because it's a different, it's a different request that caused it to be resent than the original production of that event. Uh, yes, and that is a different, but your, your retrieval is actually, it has, is not, is about that event, but it's not, it's not the same context. So the retrieval originates in you starting the retrieval. That's your, that's the origin context for the retrieval. And then, and then what you're fetching ends up being one or many events, which then have their own trace context, which is the one of the, of the producer. But your retrieval is an operation that you, without knowing what you're going to get, that you're starting out of your own retrieval context, and that's the thing that you're going to trace. But that's not where, how, how we're using this, because th that would mean that even today, the traces drop at each queue bounds. But the, the whole point of this is to try to link uh, an event that goes through multiple queues as a single line. Yeah, but you would, you would, you would, once you have the event in hand, then you can go and continue with that context. But the, just the retrieval, you can't anchor in that context because you don't know what you're going to get when you start it. Like when you just say Q receive, you have no idea what, what kind of message you're going to get, which means you know you need to choose a new, you need to root this in a, in a new context that is for that retrieval, retrieval operation. Well, okay. So in Canada, that's not what we're doing, but maybe we're doing it wrong. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, no, but but what, how, but really, how? Like you say, you say Q receive. Well, we don't because we in Knative everything is push based, and yes. every box looks like it's push based. So so that single trace parent uh, propagates throughout the entire push. Yeah. So with so with Kafka and with with any sort of queuing system. Um, it doesn't work because you are you are actively you are actively soliciting messages and you're often actively soliciting messages for good reason because you're just done with the work that you've done, which means now the cause the reason of why you're fetching new work um, is is you know motivated by a different thread of execution. You're actually measuring the performance of your of your um, task dispatcher. So I'm, I'm going to move to the next person in the queue. Unless Scott, you really wanted to jump in there. Okay. Nope, Ian? Nope, thank you. Okay. Ian, your hands up. Uh, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so I think we've already, we've already kind of talked about whether there's, there's utility in having uh, the original span ID uh, in the event. But I want to say why I think that having uh, uh, an extension for Propagation actually is useful because you know while it is redundant when you have a protocol that supports trace propagation such as HTTP or maybe Kafka, uh, you know many protocols don't. Um, and, you know if we don't have an extension where uh, those protocols can split the trace context, then they each kind of have to figure out 
uh, their own way to do it, or um, maybe create you know a new extension per protocol or something. Um, and you know the same thing is true for when events need to be persisted at some layer. Um, so you know it feels useful to have a, a single way of doing this uh, that can be one. Uh, Every every protocol um, and these middleware kind of invented their own way to persist trace context. Um, so yeah, I, I for that reason I think it is useful to have something like that as a spec. So uh, so my comment here is kind of like if this isn't uh, the mechanism for trace propagation, then then maybe we should uh, have another extension for trace propagation. Okay. Uh, Jam, your hands up. Just hearing this conversation, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am in danger of conflicting with one of my previous comments. But also, I wonder if this is what maybe the answer here. Maybe this is what Ian was saying. I'm apologies if if I'm repeating that. But moving this into the transport specs, so you say you know, explicitly in the HTTP transport spec, this is how we propagate tracing. And you do that in Kafka and again, QP and all the others. And I'm not sure if that's feasible, um, but then it becomes a very transport specific thing. I mean, I, I'm still um, arguing with myself about the whole sort of, you know, is it end to end? And, and I don't care about all the intermediary in the middle. Um, but but that that would seem to be a bit of an out, yeah. That you could m remove it as an extension and just make it part of the transport specs. If it, as as part of the transport specs, then if if we think about that, then we should stay away from this because then we're having a, a very obvious overlap with the W three C and the work that yeah. And that's my concern, yeah, because I think that's the reason this extension got added in the first place, yeah, yes. was to try and be agnostic to the transport specs, yeah. Correct. And then so I've argued myself into a corner, yeah. <laughs> because it really is, is we're doing this because there is something that the W3C spec doesn't do, and that is the end-to-end -end relationship. Yes, exactly. So that's the logic of, the logic of even having it is because we want to stay out of the thing that W3Z specs do. Okay, so I feel like we need to call time on this one um, so we don't rattle too much, but I'm not quite sure what the next step is. Is it just to encourage people to keep commenting on the issue? Or did anybody feel like we were circling around an answer? I'm not sure we were, but I may have not understood the flow. Yeah, I think future discussion on this should be useful. I'm not sure that we're at uh, agreement. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not hearing any huge things. Let, let, let's 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 take it back to the issue and see if we can make some more progress there. Um, the only thing I would ask is that we don't wait until like a day or two before next week's call <laughs> to try to get a little more conversation going. And in particular, if you spoke up on this call um, today please comment on the issue itself to try to get some conversation going there. I think that'd be appreciated. Okay. Um, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. All right, Slinky, another one of yours. Do you want to talk about this one today or would you rather uh, wait? Uh, yeah, let's wait. <laughs> because I, I, because <laughs> I, want to, I want to refactor also the, um, the, the JSON streaming one and also because I look at the comments uh, uh, Comments, but uh, I didn't reply yet, so I'm sorry. Okay, fair enough. That's good. Okay, in that case, we'll hold off. Um, okay, next one. So this is not a PR; it's an issue. But Grant was proposing that we have a PHP SDK. Um, and before I just went off and created the repo because it sounded like a great idea to me, I figured process-wise we need to make sure the group doesn't see any potential problem with doing so. Anybody have any questions, concerns with this? It seemed like a no-brainer. Okay, cool. I will make it so. Thank you, Grant. Just maybe Sorry, I want just, to make uh, a quick curious, note. Uh, I have a question on the previous one. Uh, which one? This one? Uh, the PHP. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, 
it just could just be me uh, but uh, do we see uh, you know when you talk about cloud and event sources and those kinds of things that uh, you know php is more would be or is more prevalent than rust for example because rust is being um, mentioned in the in the in this issue i would have thought that you know languages such as more server side like uh, you know, Rust and uh, Golang and Python and others are more uh, than uh, more prevalent than PHP. I'm just curious what everyone thinks. Anybody have a comment on that? Yeah. Um, so at Commerce Tools, um, so we're coming from the commerce side of things, and PHP was really strong there back since the 90s and that keeps on and like the php community is also migrating to the more cloud native modern things so yeah it's not the most popular language but there is stuff going on there i think not that i'm the cool. big php developer <laughs> well yeah oh, that's cool thank you that's fair okay i think someone else was trying to speak when Vinay was just talking there was someone else trying to say something yeah, there was a bit of delay, so I started talking together. Um, sorry. Uh, so what I, what I wanted to say is that uh, we now have a uh, formal conformance uh, process um, with uh, Cucumber. We already integrated into Golang. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's combined announcement and suggestion for the PHP SDK. Uh, so in case, uh, I'm not sure who will be working on the, on the PHP SDK, but if you want, I can also help you um, integrating conformance testing uh, so that you stick to the same set of tests we have um, for Golang and Java, for example. There you go. I think Grant is on the call. At least I thought I saw him earlier. Oh, maybe he dropped. Okay, so maybe we'll see the recording. But yeah, actually, if you want, you can put a comment in here to draw will, attention to it. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ian, is your hand up old or is that just left um, or is that new? Okay, which I thought. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Moving forward then. Um, okay. Both of these were from Mike, and he is not on the call. Um, I'm sorry. No, the first one is not from Mike. I'm sorry. It's about Mike. So Thomas, you are on the call, right? Would you like to talk to this one, Thomas? Yes. Thank you for giving me the time to talk about mm -hmm. this one. So actually for the next one, for the considering GraphQL, as you sent out the notification that we should have a look at it, I first tried to understand what the discovery and subscription APIs are about. So it felt like hours. It might have been one or two <laughs> to, to read through discovery and subscriptions. I, I literally put both uh, side by side and I figured out that there is a slightly different terminology used, especially around uh, producer, source, and yeah, I, I gave also some, some examples in, in the text. And then I also tried to understand the discovery. Mike is not on the call, I heard. He, yeah, I don't think he has it. He, he's, okay. I think it has conflict. He might be able to, to comment later during the week. Uh, so I tried to figure out what is the, the model behind or the relationship be between the different entities. And I, I tried to make a, a little drawing below. So the relationship between event provider, type and producer. And uh, by the way, type is a very misleading or confusing entity name for me. And the type has an attribute type, which I think it should have been named name rather but it, it was really not clear for me that the relationship in between it that that was just my guess here so maybe mike needs to uh, comment on that one and also the the source was mentioned in the terminology uh, so the context in which the occurrence happened but it's somehow not really linked to to the uh, information model and then to the subscription, which I think it's interrelated with the, with the discovery. Uh, there, uh, 
Thank you, Clemens, for, for providing the YAML file, which actually helps to understand the API. I also try to, to make a little model there. We really have a, just this subscription object and uh, the settings and, and somewhere on the outside, the filters. That was at least my understanding. And that's why, why I brought it up. So I, I would love to, to also uh, file a, a, a PR, but with suggestions, but if I don't have the, the real understanding behind and what was the intended, it's really difficult to, to find the right uh, direction where it should go so that it's at least for me better understandable. Maybe it's just me, but uh, I, I guess these two uh, documents, they were created kind of separate. They were. <laughs> <laughs> Since there are two authors, <laughs> so yeah. it's not really a surprise. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that the, uh, it would be great to, to align a bit the terminology and give some more background how how are we so supposed to to use or how is a user supposed to use those apis that would actually help a lot so when when did you join the group uh not so long ago actually a couple weeks ago okay so that explains it mm -hmm. uh, so we had we had we had formed two subgroups which uh, worked on both discovery uh, on discovery and on subscriptions and uh, there was some um, there were some requirements thrown over the fence, uh, but we have those two documents basically were put into the repo as working drafts to, for people to look at and do what you're doing right now. Okay. And that is um, fair enough. First of all, first of all, looking into the individuals spe uh, specs and see whether they make sense as they are, and then also um, work on rec reconciling them. So thank you very much for. Um, a fresh look and I think this is ideal uh, because you just come at this uh, uninitiated and um, uh, so I think what you're, what you're just doing here is is great work because ultimately the documents need to stand for themselves and need to make sense um, then in conjunction the mm -hmm. idea the idea behind this um, is that you have a, a way to a common way to subscribe to events Mm -hmm. And then to be able to subscribe to the events and to find the subscription manager, as we call it in the subscription uh, specification, um, you obviously also need to have a way to discover those subscription managers. Mm -hmm. And that is what this is discovery spec is for. So the discovery spec basically gives you a catalog of events and the subscription managers where you can go and, and find those. So effectively the endpoints are being described in discovery. And then subscription gives you the mechanics of how you can set up a relationship between your endpoint and uh, the subscription manager. So the subscription manager can then facilitate giving you um, the event. So that's that's the relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. And we have um, done some work on you know making those specs, and then we checked them in. And now we have um, I think we're taking a breather right now. Um, to um, then now kind of resume working on them. Um, but um, uh, also the idea was to kind of have the specs there and then uh, for people to find cycles to um, start proving, proving those out because those specifications certainly need implementation for them to, yeah. to make sense. So you're coming exactly at the right time and you're coming exactly with the right, with the right um, uh, um, level of information that is none and having read the documents. So if you want to go and, and start filing PRs to help reconciling, I think that would be super welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think exactly this, this relationship you just explained, this, this uh, how, how they interact with each other, that, that that's the missing piece. And, and that's yeah. what I probably cannot really uh, provide, maybe yeah. on a detailed level, yeah, but. If, if you, you okay, should be you should be bold and uh, <laughs> okay. and, and and go and propose. Okay. If, if you think there's a link missing, make it. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. As the the greatest thing I learned working where I'm working is nothing happens until you do it. So just go ahead. That's absolutely true. And if you don't have an idea, please file an issue anyway, because at least that will force the discussion, and maybe someone else will will have an idea of how to solve it. Um, but Klaus, your hands up. Yeah. So I. Just want to say I'm I'm really happy that someone starts to draw those diagrams. <laughs> I've been <laughs> missing this uh, thinking about the model behind all this all the time. I actually also started <laughs> by my own 
uh, drawing similar diagrams, actually the result was, was different. So um, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> it's oh, true. You can share them. That's great. Yes. <laughs> so reconcile. as we are in the same time zone, don't, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, oh, we yeah. can also have discussions. Um, maybe we can have something uh, comparable to the primer. Uh, that mm -hmm. would also explain a bit more the, the concepts behind, I don't know, subscription discovery. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense. And, and for this is not just for you, um, Thomas, but everybody. I would actually love it if people just started opening up, not even PRs, but that's, that's the dream, but even just a whole boatload of issues of things that just don't make sense, just to force some of these discussions. Because <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to think back when cloud events first got started, we had a whole bunch of issues and some of them made no sense whatsoever. They were just one, you know, a couple of words, short little sentences, but at least it helped force a, a review and a discussion about some of these topics in the spec. And I know Clement said we're taking a little bit of a breather right now, but I don't think it's an intentional breather. I think it's just maybe it's because everything going on in the world right now, people are just sort of relaxing or have other things on their mind. But I think we need something to help force some of these discussions to happen, especially in an asynchronous way. And sometimes just random silly issues just is the answer, right? To get the ball rolling again. So please don't hesitate, open them up. We can always close them, that's no harm. Okay, so thank you, Thomas. Any other questions or comments about this issue? Okay, um, so Thomas, I'm assuming that <clears throat> you will either close this issue because you'll open up more precise uh, issues or PRs, is that correct? Yeah, uh, I actually wanted to, to also hear from Mike because he, he uh, created the, the bigger, or the bigger, the discovery uh, document. So maybe some comment from him would be appreciated. Okay, well, I won't, I won't close this one. Um, mm -hmm. but I just want to make sure that ultimately, because I don't think this, this issue itself, it's, it's so broad, right? I don't think it's going to result in just a single PR. I suspect there'll be a whole bunch of PRs. So mm -hmm. but at some point we'll, we'll close it. Okay, cool. All right, in that case, um, Mike is not on the call, but GraphQL, I think there were a couple of comments on this one within the last couple of hours. Would anybody, Christoph, would you like to, any, oh. Yeah, that was mine again. Yeah, Thomas, <laughs> you too. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk to your thoughts on this one? So we have a couple minutes left. Very short, though. Yeah, basically, I agree. It should be a, just a, 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 an alternative to to REST APIs because REST APIs are so common and so so used in, in the whole uh, communities. So, but but just uh, I, I added some thoughts that it, it might not be so easy to use the REST, especially for the discovery when you see the different. Uh, uh, resources which you need to call and the matching and the search term and so on. So it's something to read through, just some thoughts uh, put together and, and what would be the alternatives and the advantages of GraphQL. And in the end, it's trade-offs. Yep. Okay. The other. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to read the comment yet, but it looks like a good one. And Christoph, did you want to chime in or save it for the issue? Oh, it's basically what I said on a call like a couple of weeks ago. So we are at Commerce to see adoption of it and it's working pretty well for us. One thought I added is that um, there's like a pattern. I don't have firsthand experience with it, um, but where you have microservices or just services that only offer REST and then you have a GraphQL gateway or API server, whatever you want to call it in front um, that takes the GraphQL requests and forwards then and turns or resolves the GraphQL fields um, by making REST or RPC or whatever calls to the individual services. So that will be one way um, where a service like um, Clement said that is too constrained to offer GraphQL itself um, could still offer it by having that um, in front of it. So for clients, um, it doesn't really make a difference if latency is not a big concern, which I don't think it is here. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in? Otherwise, we'll just keep talking about it in the issue itself. Okay. 
in that case, are there other topics people would like to bring up? Okay, before we adjourn, um, actually even before I do the, the roll call again, um, we do have an SDK call right after this one. And actually after the SDK call, Clemens, Scott and I were going to discuss KubeCon. And the reason it's initially just us three is because we were the three that had volunteered to um, run one of the sessions that we had at KubeCon. Um, so we were gonna discuss what to do about that now that they're going virtual. Um, anybody else is free to join. Unfortunately, in order to do that, you'd have to hang on through the SDK call because we don't know when the, the brainstorming session will happen. Um, but I wanted to give anybody who wanted to an opportunity to join. We will be talking about what to do about KubeCon after the SDK call, okay? And with that, let me quickly do final roll call and then we, you guys can go. Um, Normal, are you there? No, I don't see them, I see them drop. Fran, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yep. Cool, okay. Uh, Grant, I think, dropped. Oh, I got normal twice. <laughs> um, Oleg, are you there? I'm here. All right. Um, to Scott yep. yeah. Thank you, I'm, uh, I apologize. <laughs> I'm here, don't worry, yes, okay. I'm here. I'm All right, here. and did I miss anybody? Okay, for the last two folks, um, if you wanna be associated with a company, just do me a favor and put your name or your company name here next to your names, so then I'll add that into the roster. Okay. Uh, right. Like, can we edit this or? Yeah, yeah, you can edit the doc. Just go ahead and add it in there. And let me okay. paste the link into the Zoom chat in case mm -hmm. you don't Thank have you. it handy. There you go. Yep, just feel free to add it. Whoop. All right, anything else before we adjourn? All right, cool. Thank you, everybody. And the SDK call will start in just a couple minutes. Have a good one. You too. A lot of people are sticking on. What else are we going to do, Doug? Come on. <laughs> well, I'd like to eat lunch personally. Uh, my day started very early today, so I had a really early breakfast, and now I'm getting grumpy. Where are you located? I'm oh, sorry, say it again. Where are you located? Uh, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, we had a really good storm this morning. It was really cool. I love a storm. <laughs> the only downside was I was I had to do a, <clears throat> some demos this morning uh, for our WebEx call, and I had this fear that the power was going to go out because of the storm. But luckily, everything worked out good. So it was a good day so far. I have multiple power outages in the house today. Really. Yeah, but that was uh, because one of the uh, controllers for our window blinds had a massive short and that killed <laughs> <laughs> The thought of your window blinds causing your power to go out is just hilarious. Yes, it's, uh, it's sophisticated until it's not. Yeah, You're a little too dependent on technology. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm trying to remember this first issue. Do, do, do. Oh yeah, wait, where's the first where it came up? I think it all started with add support for cloud events in uh, Spring Cloud function. Uh, there should be a link uh, associated in this pull request. And uh, then we continued with the pull request and more conversation happened in the pull request. Yeah, I was trying to find the first one because it was by, so his name started with a B, wasn't it? B? Yeah, B side up. That's the one I was looking for. I thought he uh, started yes, that's with me. Oh yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, 
So where do you want me to scroll to in here? Or do you just want to start talking? Uh, I'll start talking. This is Oleg. Uh, okay. Whenever, uh, am I ready? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and start. Yep, go for it. All right, cool. So uh, basically, um, uh, so first of all about me, I'm a uh, represent, I guess, uh, Spring team. Uh, I'm a uh, lead for um, Spring Cloud Function and Spring Cloud Stream projects. Um, enough about me. Uh, so basically on the Spring Cloud Function side, we get a request from one of the um, Google Dev um, advocates, uh, James Ward, to provide support for cloud events uh, within Spring Cloud Function. So uh, naturally, we had several internal discussions as well as external debates as to what does it even mean. Um, so on one hand, uh, cloud events is a very clear um, JSON-friendly uh, specification. And as such, at least in Spring, uh, could be easily dealt with using existing Spring abstractions even right now. So and perhaps maybe you know, create a few more if need to. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this discussion has naturally led us to the fact that there is a Java SDK um, and certain abstractions defined by SDK may be of value to us, at least uh, for purposes of avoiding defining those uh, our own types representing sort of a similar things like cloud event, right? So in other words, it really became about the difference between supporting cloud event, cloud events or supporting cloud events through Java SDK. So, um, but for the sake of this discussion, uh, we're gonna assume that support for cloud events is through Java SDK. So we started looking at some artifacts and approaches that eventually led us to this discussion. So um, after these a lot of internal discussions, we um, yesterday sort of I've submitted a PR that um, simplifies and streamlines cloud event interface by effectively actually bringing it back to the state uh, or to, to a state similar to what it was in version one to ensure uh, it stays clean and clear of any assumptions about you know, implementation, transmission, storage, binding, and all those things, right? So, um, and with that, it would greatly, which Sergey will talk about a little, a little later on, uh, simplifies uh, or provides actually a path for gradual migration from version one to version two. But there seems to be, um, I guess, resistance in accepting it. And I believe it is perhaps due to some uh, misunderstandings on both sides. So thank you, Doug, for sort of facilitating this discussion so quickly, where we can, we we're hoping to come to some type of uh, resolution. Um, so um, with your permission, I have a few slides that are kind of uh, allows me to, allowed me to summarize this entire PR, because as you can see, this PR has just enormous amount of comments. Yep, go for so it. I can share the screen. Um, all right. Where are we? So um, basically, what's at question? So, the, the, and uh, this is the kind of probably the most important slide, actually, because the question is: I want to make sure that we clearly maintain this part of the discussion within the scope. And the scope is the structure of the cloud event interface, where we uh, basically moved several operations out of it and removed one operation altogether. So let's see what those are. So basically, um, motivation is, you know, some of the best uh, principles of uh, software design. So single responsibility, interface segregation. So do one thing, but do it well, and don't force me to do something I don't need to. So with that sort of a motto, we removed, um, for example, get attribute removed in favor of get of individual setters and get, I'm sorry, removed in favor of individual getters um, uh, for the attributes defined by the spec. So why? So it forces one to implement another interface, which is not really mentioned in a spec, while individual attributes are. And, you know, for example, with JSR 305, we can also distinguish from just the definition of the interface very easily, which attributes are required, which are optional. So, and it kind of makes interface very clear and very concise. And if I, the one who wants to implement the interface, I don't have to, I don't have to worry about learning how to implement cloud events interface, but also how to implement, for example, attributes interface, and then try to correlate it to specification. Get binary message, I'm sorry, as binary message, as structural message. Those methods were moved out of the, into, into a utility class for now, because they, uh, in terms of whether, the place where they were moved out to is a permanent place or a temporary place 
is a matter of separate discussion because we need to find out actually assign proper responsibility, whether those, those are builders, as we discussed, or adapters or um, converters and so on and so forth. So I classify these methods as, for example, adapters, right? Because they adapt cloud event to various binding transmission storage purposes. So, and, you know, you can kind of read the rest. Um, so, um, you know, but the, the, the main point is that we, and we discussed this extensively in the bar, that these are, these type of operations, these two operations belong to, or facilitated from the optional part of the spec. So in other words, the cloud event can exist without ever being converted to binary or structured message or vice versa, right? So, and if in my world, that's the life cycle of the cloud event, why should I be forced, for example, to implement something that I have no intentions of using? In reverse, why should I have an implementation that provides implementation for something that I don't know, that have no intentions of using, right? So, um, again, so this, this is kind of, you know, all with the desire to keep the sort of interface as lean and as clean as possible. Um, 2v1, 2v3, um, those are, again, I look at them as the converters and clearly utility operations originated due to specification change and therefore optional by default. In other words, those are almost like accidental operations because if there was no change that would govern that type of conversion, those would never exist in the first place, right? So again, I may choose in the new world saying, okay, you know what? I may choose to not support version three. That's my right, right? So why should I be forced to even question why I have that method on my interface, right? I may have a utility class that provides me with that method and that's fine. I may choose to use it or not. But on the interface, I just don't, we just don't believe that it's the appropriate place to have those operations. And um, two more methods, uh, build version of our build version three, Again, the same kind of arguments. Those are factories, um, builders, whatever. I mean, I don't, they're not really builders because they're, um, well, in my world, builder is a very clear, has a very clear, distinct, uh, very clear definition of what the builder is. So those are factories, but again, the same point. But here it's even more interesting because, well, in Java world, there are instances, quite a few actually, where we have factory method on the class that effectively creates itself, like get instance. That's a very good example for singletons, right? However, having similar operation on the interface raises the question of which implementation is it going to return? This or that, right? So in other words, when class returns the get instance, it is clear which implementation is going to return. So five implementation of the same interface, five classes will have get instance method, we can call either one of them and get a particular implementation. There's no ambiguity there. However, when it comes to having something like get instance or build version one, build version three on the interface, well, I can have multiple implementations of version one or version three. So again, it's just the wrong place to have it. So, Sergey, I'm going to turn it over to you now for the rest three slides. Yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, could you please start presenting? Just. Uh, I mean, uh, hit the play button so that it's a, bit, a little bit bigger. Oh. What, what do you want me to do? Uh, just start presenting, if you can. The, on the top bar, there's a, there's a button that says play in the very, very top. Here you go. Yeah. Yep. I stopped sharing. Oh, you stopped sharing. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, yeah. sorry for, for the inconvenience. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so we can see. Okay. Sorry, I just quickly, I'll just quickly change it to. Okay. Um, so when we start looking at the cloud events SDK, and uh, here when I say we, um, I mean both uh, Spring uh, set of projects, but also uh, Liclus, which is uh, an event gateway for Kafka, Pulsar, and others, where Cloud Event is first class citizen now, um, which is uh, which I'm really happy about. And when we started comparing version one, and version two, we realized that maybe there was too too much of a difference between these two. Uh, there were some good ones, but also some questionable ones. Um, so we decided to take a step back and look at uh, what we had in version 1.2, the current latest release. So the interface was very, very small, like just four methods. And uh, it was good enough. There were some issues, 
but uh, at least from the implementation perspective, uh, it was good enough and we were able to provide our own implementation for the interface for performance reasons, but also uh, for making it easier to adapt uh, our internal representation uh, in, onto cloud event. Uh, it is very well aligned with the specification. You'll find uh, data, uh, extensions. Uh, there is some attributes object, which is not something you find in the specification. Uh, at least when you look at it, you would usually expect attributes next to other fields like data and extensions. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, that's version one. And there are some issues with allocations, for example, in Agile, we have to pay the price of allocations where uh, we deal with, for example, optional class, uh, you need to allocate it to return a uh, wrapper or attributes. Uh, but it was lean and it was great because um, it was so easy to implement it. Then after um, the version two, uh, like after the community started working on the version two, uh, the interface have changed and now we have a lot more. Uh, most of it, um, Oleg already highlighted, but I just want to reiterate. So we still have the attributes uh, object. We now no longer deal with optionals. Uh, that's uh, the GSR 305 change he was talking about. But now we also have 2v03, 2v1, it's binary message, a structured message, and some static methods that are um, the new concepts to implement. And you as an implementer, you have to know about them and uh, they bring some issues like as structure it requires an allocation because it has to capture um, the parameter uh, and some other things. Plus it's not something you find in the specification like binary message and structure message, these are formats, but not, uh, it's not a part of a cloud event itself. It's just how you transform it into wire representation. Um, okay, I see the chat now. So if you want to share something, um, yep, I'll read the chat. Um, so it's not lean anymore uh, and it makes uh, it made it much harder to implement. What Oleg proposed in his pull request is to take a look at version one of the SDK, inline the attributes, but the rest is basically the same. So you will find some similarities with uh, version one interface. And the benefits of this approach is that uh, it maps one-on-one to the specification. Uh, it's easier to implement and it does not contain any implementation details of the SDK. And while I think that messages abstraction is a great one and it really helps to implement the bindings, I don't think that interface that represents the cloud event the ones that we potentially may use in frameworks, not only in user code, but in frameworks, should expose any implementation detail of how messages work and how conversion works. And it is allocation friendly because you don't need to allocate anything to represent the cloud event except the cloud event itself. And when we compare version one and version two, uh, which version two, I mean, uh, in Olix uh, pull request, then it becomes clear that uh, after the change, version one and version two will differ mostly um, by inlining the, the attributes and uh, we got rid of optional, which is something we already did in the master anyways, but just wanted to uh, explain the difference. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short, we think that um, during the version two efforts, we, uh, we were focusing on uh, the messages abstraction too much and we brought this abstraction to the main interface. And in fact, it's not necessary. We can keep the old interface, the old lean interface and do the conversion uh, next to the interface. But as the main interface of the whole library, of the whole SDK, the one that should be used by uh, other integrators, um, it should be as small as possible and as as close to the specification as possible. So, I think oh, sorry, go, uh, go ahead. No, I'm saying I think uh, that's that sort of concludes our presentation, right, Sergey? Yes, that's that's, that's the end of the presentation. Sort of like, uh, because what I really wanted to accomplish here is, if we were if we were not if we didn't do this, then just passing through the pull request itself with all the comments. So we're just taking more than one hour to just deal with that. 
uh, in the divisional comments. So I just wanted to kind of say, okay, well, let's forget the PR for a second. Here's what was done and here's where we're heading to and here's why. So, and um, so let's, yeah, we can still get back to the PR like offline for more comments, but we kind of would like to um, gauge what the rest people on the call think about this change and about the view of the interface that you can see right now on the right hand side, which is what it, which, which is what this PR is all about. This is the gist of the PR. The rest is just to make sure that this works. In other words, the tests are the tests are passing, so no breaking changes. Everything compiles, everything builds, but this is the cloud event interface, which identifies cloud event, and as Sergey pointed out, clearly matches the core portion of the spec. Okay, and to just to let you guys know, one of the reasons I, I specifically pushed to have this on today's call is because, and I, I could be wrong here, but I got the impression from reading some of the comments in the, in the PR that there may be a high order question here for the group. Um, because in particular, Francesco, you said something about the, the, the way that they're direct, the direction they're headed is an anti-pattern, that kind of stuff. And, and the reason I thought this was important to bring up on this call, as opposed to just leave it as a Java SDK issue, is because in the past we've talked about trying to have consistency as best we can anyway across the SDKs. And so I wanted to see if, if there was a consistent thought process here across the SDK authors to say whether, yes, this is an anti-pattern and, and Java should not do it or say, no, nope, for Java, it doesn't make sense for them to do it or something along those lines. So with that, I'll just back off. That, that was related to the comment that should application code ever use cloud event type or not? Yes. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yep. That, that's the one that jumped out at me as, uh, as a high order question. Having, having being neutral to the Java, to the Java particularities, but looking at the, the broader scope, I just pasted the, um, the C sharp um, uh, class of cloud events into the, uh, uh, into the chat. And uh, that actually- Which chat are you talking about? I cannot see where you pasted it in what? Uh, in the chat. I'm in the chat and I don't- so, Yeah, we cannot see it in the chat. Which chat, Clemens? Zoom? Uh, the Zoom chat, yeah. Oh, oh I see it's, now. it's up a little. There you go. <laughs> oh, the CS? Yeah. Oh, see, never mind. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So that effectively tracks your proposal, um, with the exception that for the model. So first, of all, I have an attribute. I have a, um, a method that is gives you that can give you um, all the attributes as a dictionary. So you get raw access to everything um, without knowing what's there. Um, and then there is a particular extension pattern that is that I'm using in the C Sharp SDK where you um, are having effectively strongly typed extensions. So that's this mm -hmm. notion of an ex of effectively of an extension, um, which I'm leaving fairly undefined here. And then um, in the um, there's a, if you if you go one level back, then there is a um, effectively there are these extensions which are um, implemented iCloud event extensions. And they are, that, that effectively allows you to plug in a strongly typed um, extension interface into the cloud event, which you are effectively, so as you are, there's some, there are some examples in the, in the readme where um, as you're parsing the event, you basically give to the parser, you're giving the extensions that you are understanding or that you want it to understand in your application. And then if there are attributes present, it will basically go and slot that into the cloud event so that you can have a strongly typed interface for them. Um, and, and the way how you get at those is like if you had like the distributed tracing extension, um, then you would walk up to the cloud event and you would say on the cloud event, you would say um, uh, in a cloud event dots and then uh, extensions of um, distributed tracing extension that would give you the strongly typed interface for it. Um, but otherwise, if you want to get at extension attributes, you simply go and tap into the into the attributes collection and that's how you get them. But everything else is a strongly typed property um, as we as they are in, in C sharp. So that so the the general shape um, with you, you know your get extensions is really my um, get attributes. 
and but and then your your um, property getters are my property getters and setters, but that's that's metric to what I have. Mm -hmm. So I only have this extra layer of, you know, a strongly typed extension model um, that I put into into that SDK, so, and that also that is also supportable with um, uh, with parsing. Okay. Scott, your hands up. Yeah. Have you considered making the cloud event interface be get data, get attributes, and get extensions, and then have basically everything that's an arrow be the attributes interface and cloud events extends attributes and returns itself if, if you access get attributes. Um, I think is what how it was before, right? That's version one. It's not exactly how it was before, but that's uh, the workaround I applied in uh, in my own cloud event implementation uh, based on version one of the SDK. Uh, so uh, get attributes was just returning this. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, I think I think one thing that is um, so in in Go we we did a lot of a lot of learning around the different layers of integration, and we found that the cloud event interface this what we're showing here is is not enough. It's really only useful for the end consumer functions. And so the, the UX around how to build up these events and how middleware deals with events and, trans, and, and shuffles it between protocols is a much more telling SDK feature. So I, I wonder if we could, I mean, like I really don't see a problem with the, this simplified interface if you don't want to have attributes. I think it was kind of nice to be able to iterate over attributes, but it's okay. The, the mechanics of how this thing turns from a active HTTP request into an object that's accessible and possibly being able to like, leave it in its fairly encoded form so you can shuffle it between HTTP and Kafka is the bigger test of like, does this SDK work? And I agree with you. And we are not questioning that. What we're trying to do is say, yes, this is a responsibility that has to be handled, but there are utilities, there are builders, there are converters. I mean, we, again, from even from the spring example, we deal with those type of issues on a kind of a daily basis when we have uh, frameworks and extensions around those issues and certain obstructions that have been around I know, for a decade now. Um, so uh, again, it's not a question of whether, whether those, um, what you're saying, um, agree or disagree, it's definitely agree, is whether, for example, the builder um, um, methods, operations should be exposed through the interface, um, this cloud event interface, or whether it is a sort of a utility functionality that, uh, in fact, as in one of the slides I was looking about the fact that, in fact, it is shared and I'd rather be able to go and many people can reuse that functionality uh, with their own implementation of cloud event, right? So that's another benefit of saying, yeah, we can yeah. have all the cloud events and dip into this reusable functionality provided by SDK and that's the value that I can get behind, for example. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. Um, in Go, we do the same thing where there's a there's a getter interface and there's a, a writer interface. Mm -hmm. So, totally, I think I think that sounds reasonable. And so we now we can start picking these things apart where we can have message interfaces and cloud event writer interfaces and things like that. And if you really just want to integrate on the cloud event interface with this, this thing that you're showing, I, that seems like a reasonable approach. Is well, you think, an example from my bias view within, within Spring Cloud Function, again, forget Spring Cloud Function, just look at it from the fu pure function. I have function cloud event, cloud event, another function cloud, cloud event. So the reason why I have two is because I broke my complexity and implemented it as two different isolated functionality. Now I want to reassemble it. How do I do it? I do function composition. So now I do function A uh, and, and, the, and then function B. So I compose two functions into one. 
well, one Octopus Cloud event and another Octopus Cloud event. Regardless that it still has to pass one internally, even though it's composed, I mean, these types have to be passed. So it's simple by reference passing, but this is where, this is exactly what I want to deal with, with nothing else, right? And then if I want to start sending it to Kafka, Rabbit, or whatever, and um, with bindings, without bindings, regardless of how I'm going to do it, right? I will. I have layers, and like for example, in, in, in stream, we have binders that will do that, right? So, again, this it's just I'm not questioning whether those things should be done. It's really more about who should do that. Should it be a jack of all trades, or should it be you know everyone has their own responsibility, and I just delegate to that one guy who does one thing but does it very well. So, Francesco, your hands up. Go ahead. Oh, wait, did it, or did, was that a wave to leave? <laughs> His hand was up there. So I, what's interesting is I'm hearing, oh, wait, no, Slinky, you're still there. Did you want to talk? No, I want to talk. I want to talk. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. So yeah, uh, no, so uh, I, uh, since I'm the one that had the, the biggest pushback on this PR, uh, I want to make a uh, couple of things clear. So first of all, uh, I think there is a clash and in what should be the goal of the SDK. And this is clearly underlined by our discussion that we had inside, uh, inside the document that I created. So can you open the document, please? No, wait a second. What's the clash? Let's finish one discussion. I want to make sure yeah. that we're in the so scope. The so the clash is my opinion is that uh, the goal of the SDK is to provide uh, a core module uh, which contains TPI, which contains the basic implementations, uh, which can be eventually split into different modules. And then uh, there is um, our, our, a range of sub-modules that the SDK provides to eventually integrate with existing tooling out there. So the user can just download the SDK and use it with Kafka, okay? Fair enough, but we're talking about strict Wow, about, and, and uh, well, this really comes down to this uh, interface because I, I fully agree with you. So for, first, uh, the SDK, since the SDK is really in a work in progress state, uh, I, I frankly admit that I made some mistakes just to make the code compile. <laughs> like the build v1 method should not be there. I completely agree with you about that. Uh, but uh, about the conversion to messages, I think they should remain there for a couple of reasons. First, uh, in, S in SDK Go, we externalized the conversion between event and message. And the result is a huge elephant called versions uh, submodule, where we need to handle all the differences between the various versions. And I mean, I, I want to avoid it because in Java, we just do inheritance. So the event itself knows how to provide of itself an unstructured view, which is really what as binary message is. I mean, as binary message, as binary message is nothing different from just having a but map that returns the attributes. So only it's not a map because uh, you are not allocating, but it's uh, it's something that you visit with a visitor. That's what as binary message really is. What element elephant are we talking about when I simply? moved uh, the method that was inside the interface that I believe should not be there. I moved it to utility class. And right now you pass that same event to that same method and the same thing happened. So because, because you need to handle the different specification versions if you move outside. Well, if you add inside the method, uh, sorry, if you add inside the, the class implementation, which is specific to the cloud event version, in that case, uh, we have attributes, but Forget about attributes. Let's yeah. assume we have cloud events v1, cloud events v0.3 uh, implementation. Okay. Uh, well, uh, again, so let's, hang on a second. So first of all, again, uh, if are you envisioning? Let me guess a different question. Are you envisioning version two, version three, version four, version five? Like how many? I mean, I'm assuming that I mean operating under assumption that cloud event is kind of like low of the land, right? So the fact that we have version 03 and now version one. There was, you know, now it was kind of expected in the very early version, like early adapters, we learned something, we created version one. Sure, I expect maybe there's going to be a few additional amendments over the years, but, you know, 
that's it. That's that's the cloud event. That's the whole. I mean, how much how much more complex can it get? So now, with that in mind, if if I am correct, and then if somebody you know can correct me, but if I if my assumption is correct, then we're talking about a very edge case, which again I can handle in utility class with a simple interrogation of the actual cloud event that was passed to that utility class and say, oh, this is version of three, so I'll get. I'll parse it differently versus because this is version of one, right? So it's not like I'm gonna have 20, 30 different versions of it. And if I do, then maybe we should have a whole different other discussion. So really, for I, I think we, we can make that assumption that things won't change. I mean, in my opinion, we can do that, that assumption. And all SDKs are designed around the idea that there could be another spec version which drastically changes some stuff. And Second, uh, moving as binary message to another uh, to to a utility method creates unnecessary allocation, which is exactly what I want to avoid in the message APIs. If so, I may, if I may uh, comment on this one, because um, ideally, these converters from cloud event into messages should be stateless uh, transformers and there shouldn't be any allocation or anything. They can even be singletons if we do not, do not aim at uh, extending them. And, um, and what I also wanted to ask ourselves uh, and uh, SDK developers in particular is version one was capable of supporting the whole spec with this interface. The question is, why cannot we do the same in version two? Why do we strictly need this as binary message and as, as structured met message? Why can't we keep them as implementation detail while still keeping the same lean interface? Because it was, uh, because it was also awful, the usage of V1. That's exactly the reason. That's exactly why we, and, and we had the same exact problem in SDK Go. And we resolved it creating the abstractions around the message. But, but we could add additional interfaces and it doesn't have to be locked up in this one cloud event interface. And the implementation exactly. say, ex, uh, implements this, that, and the other, where if you're only a reading inter, uh, implementation, you just provide the, the normal cloud event interface. And if, you are a, if you're a middleware, you, you want to take an object that's a cloud event and also a uh, cloud event to message interface or something. Um, yep. Well, how, I mean, do, we handle, how do we handle, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's one of the options we can do it. And uh, it's definitely something worth discussing to have hierarchy, like the, the pure cloud event and then decorated cloud event with additional functionality. I mean, yeah. So, uh, and here comes two questions. First. Um, how do you handle an eventual conversion from cloud event to cloud event message? Or let's, let's call it how you want, but how, we, how do we handle this conversion? And that's the first question. And the second question is, why in first instance, in first instance, you should use cloud event if at the end you don't go to the wire or, do, or you don't read from the wire? I mean, why in first instance, in first instance you are using a serialization format to that, that you type maybe to your business logic if you, in the end you don't write it to the wire i mean i think i think i can answer this one uh, it's a good question and uh i went to the specification to the sdk um, documentation and it says that cloud events in the sdk should be easily transformable as an in-memory representation they should be immutable but it should be easy to transform one cloud event into another. And that's exactly the case we have. For example, in Spring Cloud event, oh, sorry, in Spring Cloud functions, sometimes we want to accept one cloud event, return another one, and then eventually maybe send it uh, over the wire or maybe just log it. Maybe there won't be any uh, serialization or deserialization at all. Or maybe we want to represent internal structure uh, in Spring Cloud function, which is message, as cloud event to make it more, um, how to say, 
to represent it as more widely adopted interface, which is cloud event. And I believe that cloud event will become a very widely adopted interface. Uh, and, and I think, on, I, I personally think that on this particular point, you could be wrong for the really simple reason that you are tying your framework business logic to something that is a serialization format. As I said, this, it, to me, it really looks like saying I, I tie my, my framework business logic to, to a SOAP envelope. While well, SOAP, a SOAP envelope is really just a serialization format. Yeah, but that's not what it is. That, that is not what a cloud event is. A cloud yeah. event is, is a thing that is, an event is a first class programming construct and serialization is something that we do separately. And that is you're choosing JSON, you choose the Avro and that's your serialization format. But an event is a construct that you keep in your, as an element of your architecture. It's called event driven architecture because you're moving events around and events are driving the logic of your application. So it's not something that's just for the wire. It's a, it's a thing that you handle inside of your application. And, and uh, oh, so for example, how does it make sense, for example, to have a spec version for a cloud event that goes in just inside your code without ever being serialized or deserialized? Or because how does it make sense to have subject? It, it, that's very easy because you may simply have a fairly complex in-memory application that is made out of multiple modules and those multiple modules are put together using, for instance, reactive extensions. And, uh, and they need to go in, they need to exchange information in a, in, a, in a way that is also useful for exchange across the wire. Cloud events is a perfect model for that because first of all, you get, you get a way to standardize events across all of the models that you have without having to invent a new one. And then you can also go and effectively scale that system out across, across process boundaries. So it's ideal for that. Agreed. And uh, I also wanted to mention some use cases like uh, it's it it kind of is the same what Clement said, but uh, there is a real use case. Uh, for example, Debezium, um, where they needed some format to re represent events generated by the databases in a common form. They used to have their own uh, format. They just added integration for cloud events, and uh, they were using. Um, the binary representation, so they have to parse it. Um, and I've been asking them, like, why didn't you use SDKs? They decided that uh, they don't need SDKs there, I guess partially because the SDK wasn't easy to use. But uh, I clearly see how Debezium generating cloud events and then the end user in the same process, the same in the same GVM, consuming them and then doing some business logic without storing the cloud event can happen. If, if that's the goal, I, I, I kind of question the, the, the lack of the generics on the get data, because it seems like it'd be much more uh, simple to interact with this interface if you actually set typed data. I can try to answer that. Um, we thought about this, um, and uh, the analogy actually kind of uh, comes from, we, we have a very similar interaction model, uh, for example, on, on a um, on sprinkle stream sprinkle on function aside where a uh, message kind of look at message at least within the context of what I'm saying now as cloud event it also comes in with a payload as byte array because what happens is that the adapters like, like Kafka or rabbit or whatever messaging system you're using will translate the byte array um, to headers and everything else but not to the actual type because we do like a type conversion we can convert byte array to foo to bar to whatever and we know the type only at the time of function invocation, for example, right? So we need to know the type and they say, say okay, you want person, right? So I have a byte array, content type application JSON, so I'm gonna send it to the JSON converter and it's gonna create a person, fine. So, but th the point is that we really don't know um, at the time of event creation until, because you may have um, the same JSON, for example, representation is a good example. If the method that you want to invoke is a string, then you just pass the entire JSON string. But if it's a poser, you'll attempt to convert it to that poser. So now you have that flexibility and you don't have to create it twice. You're just simply passing around the byte array. But to your point, that could very well be um, um, for the internal representation. Yeah, that could very well be a T. 
I mean, if you're, if you're trying to do, you know, this event-based architecture, like Clemens was talking about, and no, 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 I, lot of events, yeah. it, it might make sense to not have to pop it all the way down to just bytes. Unless that's easy and, and I, I, it's been a long time since I've looked at Java. Uh, maybe it's easy to just like put the, the raw bytes of the object in the, in the get data. It, it is, but like, as, like you just said, I mean, you, like I was talking and almost realized it as I was talking that, that, right, I may read, but now the cloud event itself, as I'm passing it around, may, I may, by, by that time, I may have a cloud event with the actual type. Um, yeah, strong type, and yeah, and why should I convert it back to byte array as I'm only passing it to another method or something like that? It, it probably, I mean, so in Go, there's a concept of a raw, and so maybe you need an interface that says it's like cloud event that implements the raw type, which you just get base sixty four or or uh, bytes or whatever. The type is bytes. In in C sharp, I made that an object. Uh, which means you can you can set you can set and get uh, raw bytes, but you can also set a graph, and then depending on what you set there, uh, mm -hmm. the the serializer will then pick that up if it can. Um, yeah, um, like I said, object or T, and people can define whatever they want. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, Sergey, what do you think? I think this deserves a separate discussion because uh, I think we all agree on this topic that byte uh, as gate data may, uh, may not be as efficient and as uh, widely used uh, as it could be. Um, but I believe that uh, this is a bit off topic to, to the main conversation. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to mention quickly that we also have James Ward who started uh, the topic basically in, in the Java world uh, of supporting cloud events in Spring Cloud Function. So in case you have some input, James, I would love to hear your input as well. <laughs> Thanks, Sergey. Yeah, I think for me, I think the the big question around this is is do we imagine that people are going to build APIs that that use cloud event as a construct that gets passed around and shared across across different libraries and stuff? And and I definitely see that as being something really useful um, to be able to share cloud event uh, across libraries and make that a foundation that we that we build APIs on top of. Um, I think there's a lot of really compelling uses for that and interoperability between like Spring and Kafka clients and um, Spring and other frameworks and libraries that build on top of that. So, so that's that's something that I would certainly like to see um, happen with us. What do you guys, Linky? So, for what regards to data, uh, the real reason why the uh, the it returns a byte array. It's just to, uh, it's because we don't have a data codec like uh, thing that we have in SDK group. So if you don't, w w without any conversion, you can't effectively do the conversion like we do in SDK group that we have a method like data as that converts the, the binary representation into a structure, uh, into data structure. Um, and that's the point about data. Um, a, 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 about um, the interface, I still think that we have a big problem when we start saying, uh, I mean, f from the, um, from the serial, uh, serializator and the serializator point of view, how do I handle if a cloud event, it's not serializable? I mean, sh should I accept only cloud event serializable and the serializable interface? I mean, how that, how that really works? Because that's that's the point in the end. Well, I think this can be solved with the the like we take a look at those personas and we we can think where each interface makes sense. And so like this interface looks like very simple consumer, but it's probably inappropriate for middleware because it's going to be too cumbersome and you don't get the ability to let the object itself understand how to turn itself into the structured version for a protocol. Right, so can can we like I think I think the simple way to agree here is that we say we're going to look at an interface hierarchy for certain implementations to implement as optional, and if Spring would like to be to just use the in, the cloud event interface and internally do a bunch of magic, that seems like it's okay. 
because um, it doesn't have to use the, the message interfaces. What, what, what I really propose here is to, uh, we, we can, what we can also do is to keep uh, as binary and as structured message and, pro and provide a base implementation that implements this just calling get spec version, get ID, get type, or whatever. So to their, to their point, it doesn't make the, like the binary side of it is optional for a lot of protocols. Yeah, you see, but as binary is weird because what, what binary really does is it is a projection of a cloud event into a particular transport message. So HTTP binary is a specific encoding of a cloud event using the HTTP message as its uh, carrier. The same thing is AMPP binary is using the AMPP message definition as the carrier for a cloud event. The cloud event gets completely exploded on top of those, those carrier messages. And then they also get pulled back from it. So there can't be an implementation of get binary that is not specific to the transport because those representations are different. No, similarly, I, I, similarly, there can't be a format independent implementation of get structured because the JSON implementation and the, the, JSON, inter the JSON format's internal structure differs from that of Avro. Um, no, uh, no comments. I think, I think in this case, uh, maybe, maybe you misunderstood from the names because uh, as a structured message, uh, it's really a view of the event, but serialized with the provided format. Yeah. While as binary message is an um, unstructured view of the message, but, without, but avoiding uh, any allocation of a map of a, or of a stream. But that's really what it is. If you look at the interface of a, mess of a binary message, what you see is that it's just the unstructured view that then the serializers that uses for writing um, the attributes, writing the extensions, and writing the payload inside the, 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 the outbound messages. Yeah, so the thing I don't understand is that if you, the only thing you need for serializing the events is because we treat all the attributes alike, like they're all the same from, from a serialization perspective. And so there's a, there's a, there's a co collection of attributes that you need to maintain because you need to maintain one anyways because you have extensions. So, and, and as you read them, uh, you're not reasoning there. You're reasoning about them, likely. So there's a there's a there's a there has to be an attribute collection, and that's the attribute collection you give to the serializer. And there's two kinds of serializers we have, um, which are there are serializers which turn the event into a standalone payload, which are all the structured ones, and then there's a second kind of serializer which turn the cloud event into map that onto a message of a particular chosen transport. But those both can feed from the same thing, which is a list of the attributes and um, access to the data. Um, sorry for interrupting, but um, since I guess we have other topics other than this one, uh, this one is still important, but still, uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, I don't know, conclude it with something. And I would really like to ask the question and hope we can get a concrete answer whether cloud event is a type that should be consumed by the end user and should be seen by the end user or not. And yes. I guess it is so. Yes, it should be. That's the purpose of it. Okay. It's not a soap bubble. <laughs> <laughs> soap bubble. <laughs> did, did this conversation at least kind of ease some of the, the heated text debates that are happening? I, I, from Nazar's point of view, it seems like it has, because I think that was the high order question, right? Is cloud event a first class entity a, a user should see? <clears throat> and it sounds like the answer is yes. Well, maybe not unanimously, but I'm hearing more yeses than noes, put it that way. I, I think it's yes for certain personas, which, which like the, the existence of a persona that only cares about this particular interface means that it probably should be its own independent interface. 
Okay. And then I guess we can uh, move the conversation into the direction of whether the, this interface should also cover the serialization, deserialization, or maybe there can be more concrete interfaces for uh, the wire question. That we can I, think, I think, I think it, uh, that's where we don't agree. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the whole point. I mean, because again, for, for the order, I, I agree with an interface like that, except in my opinion, you should have uh, the, the, the view of the, of the event yeah. ready for being serialized, deserialized. And we can, again, we can. And, and again, I, I, I don't see how a, ba a base class can solve this problem. And, and at the same, I mean, uh, maybe we should you, take it offline and uh, collaborate on solving it all together. Okay, yes, for sure. I guess then, then to your line, Sergey. Um, should we, I mean, obviously there's going to be, any meeting is going to end up with a lot of open questions. Um, should we, um, what should we do with um, this PR and should this other discussion be discussed as part of this current PR or should it be incrementally, as you know, we also discuss about making small PRs manageable, saying, okay, well, if at some point of time we decide to add those operations back into the interface for whatever reason, then that's going to be a separate PRs and so on and so forth. Like, so I would um, say first, let's get rid of 2v1 and 2v03, which we can easily get rid of it and in, in a separate PR. And also we can also get, and we can get rid of the build methods that should be in a cloud event builder interface. So a cloud event builder interface should eventually propose these static methods to create B1 and B03. So that's, that's, a, that's a beginning and definitely unblocks the situation. We're saying get rid of, um, that may no, not be the right way of saying it because in version one, they didn't even exist. So they were added recently without actually having the discussion like we're having right now. Um, so maybe we should really say, okay, well, you know, the, the real change between version one and what's proposed right now is the attributes. So we can kind of, I don't know, take a vote on that and say, okay, fine. So whether we're accepting it or not, and then say, okay, well, maybe next week or whatever, have discussion about a variety of other methods and whether they should be there and maybe Francesca, you can, um, um, you know, take the floor and actually, you know, present a bigger argument there. I don't know. Because I, unfairly, we've been sort of um, um, kind of took control of this discussion, but uh, maybe the next time, I just want to make sure that we don't have uh, within this effort, there's no PR that's sitting there discussed and keep changing, 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 changing until the point where we don't even remember where it began, right? So. So um, can we can we take this back to the PR or because you, you, to be honest, you guys can actually have another phone call if you want to discuss this because I do feel like we made some good progress. Um, and you can actually use the Zoom channel if you want. There's no password. You can start up anytime you want if you want to have another face-to-face -face chat. Um, but there are other topics on the agenda. I don't know, some of us have to stop at the top of the hour. Do you want to discuss the Java V2 one or is that part of this discussion already? Uh, it is part of this discussion already and the, 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 the V2, I mean, we only have eight minutes. I don't think that document that Francesca wrote is pretty extensive. There is, it'll probably take another hour to discuss. Um, I, but I would really like to, and, and I, some, something tells me a lot of people on this call would like to, to, to sort of uh, bring this discussion to a conclusion, some type of conclusion. Um, because again, we're not discussing a release that will happen tomorrow. We're discussing, okay, this is what we agree on. Let's merge that. This is what we didn't agree on. Let's discuss it next time. But right. let's take the starting point as where we were in version one, not where we were, where we are intermediary. And all of a sudden, you know, it's a different way of looking at it. Are we adding or are we removing? And at this point of time, I'm saying, we added something that I believe we shouldn't. So let's discuss it. And uh, if we, at some point of time, do agree that we need to add it, then we'll add it. We have plenty of time to do that. But at this point of time, I just don't think we had enough discussion, enough debate to come to 
any kind of conclusion about any of those methods other than the ones that represents the attributes, right? So adding it, keeping it there is not the right way of looking at it. We can, we, we wanna do this clean sheet approach where we're gonna add things based on, you know, technical merits, not throw everything and then start removing things that we don't really need, so. Okay, so how would you guys like to proceed? Do you wanna just stay on this call and keep going? Or do you want to set up another call? Do you want to go back to the PR? How would you guys like to work forward? Because you can stay on this call too if you want. Uh, we can basically, I mean, is there a way? So that, that document is a, a starting spot, not a proposal. It's an invite to come and collaborate on like what the future of this SDK should look yeah, like. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I've just dumped it more or less what I, what I already done. I mean, it, it's just a dump of ideas of what I already done and what I would love to have, but yeah please collaborate on the document. And again, I think we can unblock some parts of that PR easily. So what's, what's the answer to my question? <laughs> Take it offline? Well, my fear is yeah, that it's the late other now. PRs <laughs> for me. This PR will become eventually unmergeable and this is just gonna, um, um, cause we can definitely debate things, but uh, we almost need to, like, I think taking the flag is offline is a good idea because we just got some new information whether a cloud event is a end user type or not and some other things. So maybe we can just re-evaluate the pull request and uh, make some new assumptions and maybe get rid of the previous ones uh, so that we can progress on the pull request. And uh, I really like the idea of having map of attributes from the C-sharp version, for example. And I think once we evaluate it, then Francesco will find it very useful for encoding the events so that maybe we can get rid of uh, two structured to binary, uh, for example. So let's just take it offline and look at the code again with the new information we received. Uh, fair enough. Okay, cool. Okay, um, I apologize, this isn't an SDK topic, but we had talked on the previous Cloud Events call about uh, talking about KubeCon. Unfortunately, I cannot stay past the top of the hour, which is in four minutes. Um, Clemens, yeah. are you available to talk tomorrow morning? Um, I'm sorry, not tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon your time. 7.30 Pacific time, which is what, 4.30 your time? No, because we have a holiday tomorrow. Oh, bummer. <laughs> um, we, m m Monday. Okay, what about, what time Monday would you guys be able to do? I mean, I, I get out, I get up pretty early, so. You know, like that's 7 a.m., 8 a.m. kind of time frame work. That would be great because that doesn't conflict with uh, my with my Seattle people. Okay. As long as we can end by 10.30 my time, I think I can do it. Um, let's... Time zone math is too hard. Yeah, so let's... 4.30 your time. <laughs> Clemens. 4.30 my time works. Great. No, no. I have to end by 4.30 your time. Oh, so let's do let's do four. Let's do uh, four. Um, we don't need more. We don't need more than half an hour. Okay. So for my time, what is that for you? That's ten me. That's seven. Ten, for... ten, yes. Okay. All right. That will work. All right. Let's okay. Do okay. Anybody else on the call who's stuck around for that particular conversation? Is is there a major objection to going with um, ten a.m. Eastern on Monday? No. Okay, cool. I'll send that. A, I'll send out a note to people who want to join. I'm also going to leave now. Then. Okay. Yeah. So there wasn't. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll take the other topics to the to the either to the mailing list or to the next next call that we have. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. It was really helpful. Thank you. Bye. Cool. Thanks. Cheers.